Hey everybody, welcome back to Katya's Confidential. I'm your host, Brian Ortega, and on this week's episode, we're going to be talking hotel hierarchy. So this is definitely going to be a more behind-the-scenes look of a hotel here in Las Vegas, and essentially what the hierarchy of all the different positions are in the hotel. So it'll essentially hold a couple little tips and tricks, but this is more of a fun little sort of listen-along of what sort of the hierarchy is, who is important, who is sort of like at the bottom of the food chain, and who is the big cheese. Um, This also is going to be interesting to think about if you're wondering how uh, hotel workers come into the business and then work their way up to become like, say, the CEO or the president of a hotel. So hopefully you guys enjoy this episode, and um, it's coming up next. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into the hotel hierarchy. So I always find these really fun to talk about because there are so many positions inside of a hotel. Um, You have everybody from the front desk agent all the way up to the managers, so on and so forth. But what do they actually do and how much power do they actually have? Um, If you want to listen back to our episode that we talked about, who do you complain to? um, These would actually make really fun uh, pods to go together just because some of the pa- some of the responsibilities are the same. So let's go ahead and we're going to start at the bottom and then work our way up. And I'll explain kind of what each position does and, you know, as we go from there. So we'll use the front desk and the concierge desk as the example. Um, obviously, when you talk about restaurants and such, restaurants have their own hierarchy, um, which that can actually be um, maybe part of this as well, um, which I'll glance over at a couple different portions when it makes sense. So um, a lot of people, the hardest part about working in a hotel is breaking into the business. And that's really with any of these unique jobs, especially jobs where they're in high demand. So like that's in TV, that could be for, you know, high end resorts on the strip. Uh, because hotels on the strip for for a number of reasons, uh, pay actually actually pay very well. Um, so many people who move to Las Vegas uh, want to work on the Las Vegas strip. That's where you can get the most tips. That's typically where you have the corporations that pay, you know, pretty well in terms of hotels. Um, I would definitely say that hotels on the strip pay above the national average for hotel workers, uh, which kind of makes it sort of the mecca of um, hotel or hospitality, the hospitality industry. Um, Obviously, you have places like the Plaza in New York. You have, you know, the Ritz-Carlton in Los Angeles. But I have to say, with my, um, my relationship with Marriott, Um, I found that the Ritz-Carlton, specifically that company, um, does not actually pay very, very well. Um, I won't go into specifics, but in terms of the high level of service that is required, um, does not pay on the same par as, say, uh, MGM uh, properties. Um, So kind of interesting to look at it that way. Although Ritz-Carlton does require a very, very high level of service to work at their properties. So you typically have to have a pretty good uh, track record, um, obviously your resume, and then uh, going on from there. So for example, uh, I actually, during COVID, when I was you know laid off from MGM, um, I actually went and I was went, moved back home and I actually had put... Um, an application out to work at a Ritz-Carlton, which we had a Ritz-Carlton Dove Mountain in Tucson, Arizona, uh, which is sort of like the highest hotel they have in Tucson. And typically uh, the the interview process or the um, application process takes a while for many of these very large corporations. Uh, So for example, I applied for MGM Grand. That took at least a month for them to get back to me, a month, a month and a half. Um, and then, you know, then you go in for your interview, which is very, very exciting, uh, for Ritz Carlton, this is during COVID mind you, since I had so much experience working in MGM on the Las Vegas strip, I put my application out on a Wednesday and got an email back on Thursday or Friday of the same week. So literally less than 48 hours, I was sent an email about an interview uh, for Ritz Carlton. And it was a, you know, their concierge position as well, um, which was, you know, similar. So it was very, very quick. So one thing led to another, and I was doing an interview the next week, which I don't know if this happens for a lot of people, but that was very, very quick 
for me. So um, I actually ended up not taking the position because of the pay, uh, which it was also a lot of things that had to go with it as well. So like I would have had to move from Las Vegas back to Tucson, Arizona. Um, I would have been paying, you know, getting paid less, but, you know, living with my parents at the time because, you know, it was COVID. So it kind of just made sense. But I ended up finding, you know, on the same day that I had my interview, I got my other job offer for the current place that I work now. So, uh, and I got to stay in Las Vegas. So part of that was location, but we're getting off the point. Really just wanted to get back to the hierarchy of hotels in Las Vegas. But that'd be a fun personal anecdote of letting you know that sometimes, even though it's a five-star hotel, um, it doesn't mean that the pay is reflected in that hotel. But a lot of people want to break in to hotels on the Las Vegas Strip. And we'll use the front desk as an example. The front desk is a break-in job. Uh, the front desk is typically the break-in job for the property, along with being like a hostess at a restaurant. That's typically the break-in job to get you into the business. Um, typically, the going rate for somebody who works at the front desk, at least I'm kind of just kind of going off the top of my head um, and sort of generalizing where you would get paid. Uh, most of the time, your range of pay is going to be between, uh, you know, coming in between sixteen and seventeen fifty, or sixteen and eighteen dollars, depending on inflation and so on and so forth. Um, so typically between sixteen and eighteen dollars, which also usually includes commission on any upsells or things of that nature. So the break-in position, being the front desk, you are trying to learn the business. Uh, typically, you do not need a uh, you don't need a degree to get this position. Typically, people who work at the front desk, um, they usually have to be 21 years old because they have to be in a casino, especially in Las Vegas. Uh, some places may be able to get away with 18, but most people are have to be 21 and over. Um, that is usually the case. So you'll see people range from the early 20s all the way into their 50s because many people really enjoy the front desk position job because it actually allows you a certain level of power um, and a good first step into the business. Um, so uh, a lot of people who work at the front desk, let's use MGM Grant as example, um, can typically make uh, about, just depends, uh, typically can make close to about 50000 a year. Um, and again, it really depends on if you're a full-time worker, which a lot of times you are not, uh, many times people who come in at the front desk level, um, are part-time or on call, uh, part-time is okay. On call is absolutely terrible. Uh, full-time is the best. It's actually very rare to be a full-time agent right out of the blocks. Typically you are hired as a part-time agent and then it kind of goes from there. MGM being one of the larger properties had one of the largest teams. I think they had like over like almost 200 people who worked the front desk. We had a team of about 80 uh, for the whole concierge team. So, and most of us were full time. There were only like maybe two part timers and like one on call person. So it was very, very rare to find that. But when I got hired at the concierge desk, um, I actually got hired as a full-time person right out of the gate. So I got very, very lucky. But again, when you work the front desk, your level of service uh, typically is taught to you. Um, it's typically, you know, really ingratiated into you. They do like younger agents um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the cool things about having a younger agent is that they haven't worked someplace else. So it's much easier to teach them rather than have to teach somebody else of their bad habits. But the good thing about hiring agents who have a little bit more experience is that they know what the interaction is supposed to be like when you're dealing with guests. So typically that is where you start. They typically have the most influence over guests in the direct term. So typically room reservations, uh, moving people's rooms, upgrading rooms. Um, they're the ones that you have to talk to. They're the, really the first line of defense, if you will. They're the foot soldiers that have to deal with the guests on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, don't mean to make this sort of adversarial with guests being sort of like one side and then the agents being the other, but they're really the first line of defense before we get to, you know, if we have an issue. So they're really there to solve any of your frontline problems. Like, Hey, my key isn't working. Hey, this didn't work. Um, how does food and beverage work? That is their sort of level of, you know, level of service or their level that they can take care of for you. Um, fun fact, 
front desk agents, the young ones, um, are typically the first ones to jump at going to an invite for a nightclub. And anytime you get an invite to go to a nightclub, they will always want to go, especially if you extend that out to them. Um, why? Usually, they don't get invites if you are working the front desk. Not a lot of perks if you are a front desk agent. Um, typically, it doesn't come with the territory to get invites for really anything in town. Um, even inside of your own hotel, front desk agents aren't privy to that either. They're really the first step is working the front desk for anybody who also is looking for hospitality to become their career. Because that is the basis of everything is the front desk and booking rooms, dealing with guests, that's really where you get all of that training. So you typically get a lot of people who have graduated from UNLV, sorry, have graduated from any hospitality school, but we always say UNLV, which we have everybody does that. Um, and typically, people who are working at the front desk who are younger um, haven't graduated from UNLV yet. They're typically going to school for hospitality. It's typically on their resume that they're going to school for hospitality. Um, that's usually a helpful one because then once you graduate, you typically can move up to the next level, which is uh, manager on duty. So typically a manager on duty um, or an assistant manager, they're typically sometimes interchangeable depending on where you work. Um, that person, the assistant manager, um, has a lot of the same let's just say powers that a manager will. Um, an assistant manager will typically be the first person that you go to after the front desk agent. And that is typically when it comes to having a guest who's really upset with their room, their room type, and all the, so basically all the options have been exhausted that it has to go up to another level. Um, there's only a certain amount of things a front desk agent can do before we have to bump it up to the next level, which would be you know, giving any compensation, for, you know, maybe a room not, you know, living up to its standards, which eh, that one's kind of weak. But for example, things not working in the room, then it goes up to the next level, which typically that is where the assistant manager or manager on duty uh, will come into play. Um, assistant managers and managers are similar. A lot of times assistant managers will do an assistant manager job when they are basically training to become a full-time assistant manager or a manager on duty. So uh, the front desk does have many of these options. They basically have a front desk agent. Then you have a lead, which leads typically are like kind of a ceremonial position, if you will. Um, then you have the assistant manager. Then you have the manager. And then, um, then you have directors above that. But managers and assistant managers, managers specifically, are able to move rooms at will, do what they would like to do. If they want to move you up to a higher room, they can do it. They can upgrade people without charging, which they don't try to do that, which is why they are managers. Uh, but managers and assistant managers, managers specifically, are the ones that are going to be able to <clears throat> move your room to a view, move your room to a higher floor, and really have a lot of access. Um, a lot of the people who become managers are really on the track to work in hospitality for most of their life, to be honest. Um, just because it's actually a really well-paying job to be a manager of a very large property, and it is actually one of the easier ways to go to other properties around the entire world. Um, especially if you are a manager here in Las Vegas, uh, they tend to be um, really in sync with a lot of the other departments as well. Um, the cool thing about working in concierge is that you deal with many departments every single day. You deal with the food and beverage team, you deal with uh, house, uh, sorry, the restaurants on the daily basis. So working in hospitality, sorry, working in the concierge department, you deal with a lot of these. Um, concierge department is very similar. You have sort of like the frontline agents, which is the regular concierge, which our position was not needed to be a, you didn't need a degree to become a concierge, but you do notice a lot of places in Las Vegas that the concierges are, have become much older, um, especially after the pandemic. I don't know the reasoning why, to be honest with you. Um, I think a lot of the younger concierge ended up going and getting different jobs and sort of branching out to different places. Um, and a lot of the career concierge stayed in their positions. And uh, the, the nature of the business has changed just a little bit for the concierge team. But concierge teams also have assistant managers um, or supervisors. Um, I forgot to mention that there's like a supervisor sort of in between. Um, that's sort of the 
level before you get to the manager or supervisor. Um, it really depends, to be honest, um, because concierge in the concierge department, we had um, ass like assistant managers, and then we had supervisors, and then we have a chef concierge, which is if you have a Le Claydor member, they become your basically, basically they're like a director um, or right underneath a director. They're basically on the same level. It's just a different fun word for it. But anyways, still using the front desk as an example, um, the managers or managers on duty. They tend to be the ones who can do the most for you when it comes to your hotel room, which gives them a lot of power if they are inside of a giant hotel like MGM Grand. Um, for example, the difference between, say, a manager at the front desk and the manager at the concierge desk is that the manager for the hotel really deals with the most stuff inside of the hotel. And that's if they're having issues with plumbing, if they're having issues with their television, if they're having issues that they don't like their room, it's that kind of stuff goes to the manager. The chef concierge, their job essentially is to delegate, of course, uh, because a lot of the stuff that we do is base, is, is very face-to-face. -face. If it gets to a chef concierge, it has really got to be a super, super important thing that they have to deal with because um, typically that's what the supervisors are there, are there for um, because typically a lot of times the chef concierge is dealing with a lot of vendor issues, um, not issues, but just really those type of things. Um, and dealing with other departments of how to better work our department, that's really what the chef concierge is for. So most of the time, you're going to be dealing with a supervisor for the concierge desk, which essentially are very, very close to becoming uh, chef concierges or managers in their own rights. And they usually have been there for a very long time. To be a supervisor for a concierge team, um, it actually takes quite a long time to become a supervisor um, in those departments, especially if it's a very large department um, or especially if it's a very small department because, you know, they be or they become very tight knit. Um, the average age for somebody who works in the concierge uh, departments typically range between 30 and 50. So you're looking somebody who's in their 40s. Um, so you definitely get a much more mature concierge. Although um, when I was there, there was a good mix of um, older concierge and then also um, younger ones as well. So like, you know, the rookies and then, you know, the vet, the vets, if you will. So anyways, that's that department. But front desk, very, very interesting. Um, they do have obviously their manager on duty. And then after that, for all of these departments, ends up going to the directors. Um, a lot of these positions were eliminated during COVID or right before COVID. Uh, we had a thing called MGM 2020. Um, which if we ever said you got 2020, that usually meant that somebody got, you know, let go. But a lot of the mid-level directors um, got let go. And a lot of directors were sort of in charge of many different departments. Mm -hmm. Directors, you tend not to come in contact with very much um, at a guest level. So that's not very helpful for you guys. Uh, but directors tend to bounce around depending on whatever that they're needed for or whatever the next building block of their department is. A lot of these people have been in hospitality for a very long time. Typically, a lot of them come from the front desk. A lot of them come from housekeeping, which is a very, very interesting director position to have. It's one of the most stable positions to have is to be the director of housekeeping uh, because, again, you're not, you're not as front-facing as, say, the uh, director of hospitality, uh, which usually is the front desk. So um, we had a director and they were the director of luxury services, uh, which they were in charge of the high, like the, um, the sky lofts as well as the concierge team was all looped into sort of that section, um, which have all these other little picadillos, but it was very interesting depending on who your director was, was how, you got funded, which is very interesting. So if you're wondering the thing that we always cared about the most, that we always told directors, uh, because we were very comfortable in our jobs at the time, was um, can we get new uniforms? That was always the big thing, was always can we get new uniforms? Um, and I don't know if they've got new uniforms at uh, MGM Grand. I'd have to double check and ask. Uh, but again, 
Very interesting. Uh, but after directors, then you get to the vice presidents. The vice presidents, obviously, those are going to be top tier level. And then, of course, you get to the president and the uh, CEO of the companies. Um, in Las Vegas, the ecosystem of how our um, our sort of like jobs work is is that they're always very much interchangeable especially once you get to that higher level they want you to be as diversified as possible just like anything else um, but I've seen a lot of people bounce around from MGM Grand to New York New York to Park MGM and then back over to New York New York so it is one of those very interesting ecosystems where you kind of all know each other um, and you try to do you know your best as you can but does it help to have a hospitality degree Yes, it does, especially when you're trying to become a manager. Um, a lot of times they want to see that you have taken classes that say that you know how like accounting works. That's always kind of a huge deal. Um, it really just depends. You've seen a lot of people who live in town that do not want to move out of the position that they are currently in just because it is very, very beneficial for them. So um, I always think if you're wondering if you want to break into the this job. Uh, the front desk is always a good first place to start. It is very, very hectic, especially if you work at a hotel that has a high volume of guests. So for example, MGM Grand, the Venetian, the Palazzo. If you're going to places like Caesar's Palace, that also has a large inventory in terms of their room types, um, especially places that have very large convention centers like Mandalay Bay. A lot of these places, it is very much volume, volume, volume. And then typically that is where you break in, especially if that you've never worked the front desk before. Those are some places you'll break into. Um, and then from there, you can usually move up in terms of service. A lot of times it starts at like quantity and then you can move into the quality aspect of it. So for example, places like the Win, the Encore, Arias, uh, Aria Sky Suites. Um, these are places that will not take, typically do not take first time front desk agents just because there is such a different level of service that is needed to work at those properties. Obviously learning all the systems is sort of the first thing to do, which a lot of times we kind of all use the same system, especially if you're inside of the same building. Uh, for example, MGM, not same building, but same company like MGM Grand would have very similar systems to Mandalay Bay because we're all owned by MGM Resorts. Um, so most of the time we used Opera. That's the business or the company that we used to use. Uh, I think they might have changed it sort of right before I left. Um, but you kind of all, that's where you learn the systems. That's how you learn sort of the ecosystem of a hotel. Uh, then you go up into luxury service, like I mentioned, like Wynn and Encore and Aria. Uh, and then it, once you've done that very well, once you sort of topped off on your luxury service, especially on the front, you know, the front lines, you may move up to become a supervisor or a manager or some sorts. It is very important. I think this is important to say for any business that you're always looking up or moving up. So most people who become a manager somewhere typically, unless something's gone wrong, will not go back down to become a front desk agent. Um, just because there's actually a very low supply of people who have managerial experience, um, which a lot of that is sort of the building blocks of what that is. Um, a lot of managers in town make between 70 and $85,000 a year, depending on the property that you work at. Um, once you get into the director and vice president positions, you start making over 100000 And if you are a vice president, you can make somewhere close to around $200,000 a year. So again, these are sort of general numbers. It does depend on the property that you're at. For example, somebody at the Win and Encore is obviously going to make some more than somebody at, let's just say, like Harrah's, for example. So again, just really depends on where you're working at. Um, just sort of going to restaurants really quick. Um, I have a friend the I have a friend that was part of the union, and she was getting paid twenty dollars an hour to work as a front de uh, a hostess at one of these uh, restaurants inside of a casino. So it is very doable to make a pretty good living here. But again, jobs are sort of getting smaller and smaller. Um, one of the jobs that people think might be really easy to get, but is actually really hard to get 
is being a cocktail waitress. Being a cocktail waitress is one of the hardest jobs to get. It's definitely one of the jobs still in town that kind of operates off of that old school sort of vibe. Uh, don't don't go there with your brain um, where you definitely have to know somebody to get the position. Um, you have to, you know, know the vice president of the hotel, know the manager of the casino, and it's definitely going to be the most helpful way for you to find your way into getting an audition to work as a cocktail waitress. Cocktail waitresses tend to make a pretty good living in town. It is very hard work that you have to stand basically your entire shift, serving drinks, being personable. You are the face of that particular property. And of course, if you're trying to work for a union place, which there are many of them, there are many, many cocktail waitresses have been doing this since the 70s and 80s. Yes, I know that's a very long time ago um, that are still working around town, um, doing their thing. So it is actually a very hard job to do. I knew a girl who was a front uh, hostess for a restaurant um, because this was a smaller property. And again, not smaller, but I mean, it is. Uh, Since she saw the manager of the hotel or the vice president of operations of this hotel every single day, She just got in his ear and was like, hey, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. She finally got an interview with the food and beverage manager, and she knocked it out of the park, got the job, and she is currently a cocktail waitress at this property. So um, it's a lot of just keep telling people you can do it till you can do it, Uh, but it is definitely one of those jobs that people still want, sort of like valets back in the good old days. But anyways, that was this episode of Concierge Confidential. Hopefully you guys really enjoyed this particular look back into the back of the house. Um, Again, my name is Brian Ortega. If you see me out in town, come say hello. Make sure you say keep it confidential. That's always helpful for me to know that you listen to the pod. And if I see you out in town, remember, keep it confidential. Confidential.